Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, this is the January 21st, 2020. 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Gailey. To my right, we have uh, Vice Chair Carter, Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Boswell, and Commissioner Sutton, all here. So, um, Vice Chair Carter, if you would please lead us in an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. You want me in prayer? Father God, as we join together here tonight to do the business of the citizens of Alamance County, we ask that you be with us, that you open our hearts and our minds, that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. We ask that you guide our deliberations. We ask that you keep us all safe, that you take us into this evening and take us all home safely tonight. We ask your Lord that you be with our community and keep it safe in this coming week. We ask all these things, dear Father, Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on our agenda tonight is public speakers who want to address the board on an agenda related item. We have a second time for public speakers at the end of the meeting for uh, items that are not related to the agenda. We do have one person signed up for an agenda related item. We also have a person um, signed up. Uh, we have a public comment policy which is available to be viewed online and one of those uh, number three under the public comment policy says speakers who require accommodation for disabling condition can um, get an accommodation. So we have a person tonight who wants to speak on a non-agenda related item who um, has requested accommodation. So we're going to let her go first. Okay. So uh, Ms. Barbara Williams, if yeah. you want to come up to the podium, we are uh, glad to be able to accommodate you in that request tonight. Now for being here and letting me voice my complaint. So it's Lawson. Thank you for answering my email. On December 12th, 2017, I had a stroke. Now I'm at County EMS rushed me the most come. They had me under the incorrect name. Now, if y'all have a problem understanding me, please ask to repeat. So, when I got home at the rehab, I got the statement in the mail. And I called Alamance County EMS, let them know they had the incorrect name. I spoke with Kelsey on the 22nd of 2018. I told her the correct name and gave her all of my insurance information. She said she'd take care of it, and if I didn't have enough bill in the mail, that it was taken care of. On November 19, 2019, Alabama County EMS billed me again for the same day. They did not have my insurance on file. I spoke to Cami F and Tina multiple times at Alabama County EMS. I gave them my insurance information so many times. So I called Blue Cross Blue Show because I was told by Tina 
that my insurance has been filed January 22nd, 2018, and then again December 4th, 2018. They have the incorrect information. I call Blue Cross, verify this, should clean us there, but they had gotten no response for Alabama County and Mass. No uh, claim was submitted. So I called Alamance DMS back, Dr. Tammy, told her, I said, now, insurance has a, a grace period. Usually in network, it's six months. Out of network, it's 18 months. They had ample time to file this correctly, and they did not. <laughs> so I got the second bill. December the 18th, 2019. And again, I called them numerous times on December 26th, December 30th, 2019, January 6th, 2020. And they said it was in review. When I said Commissioner Lashley a email informing him of this, I got a response from Casey Graves, who's a liaison for EMS, and she's asking me for my insurance again. I gave it to her, let her know that it's been multiple times that I've given it out, and explained to her that the Blue Cross had a, a timely manner to handle these claims. I've heard nothing. So this has been over two years out. And I understand Alabama's County EMS is a third party. They've had numerous complaints. The last one I believe I read online was 2015. It's very similar to mine. So I told Casey that yeah, Alabama's EMS was responsible they had ample time to file this. They should absorb this claim and resolve this amount to absorb it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Williams. Yes. Um, if you want to return to your seat, we have uh, one other person who wants to speak to the board on an agenda-related item, and then we'll have the opportunity for commissioners to respond to what you said. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, Chelsea Miller. And if I could, uh, I was switching out speakers. Uh, usually speakers have three minutes. We gave Ms. Williams extra time because um, we should accommodate her. But the rest of you are not going to get that. So. You're <laughs> special. So we're putting the clock on you, so three minutes. So. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you again for being here. I've seen you all a few times. I'm Chelsea Miller. I live, um, I'm a veterinarian. I live in the northern part of the county. And I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for hearing kind of multiple people ask about sort of the solar energy, the hydro, renewable energy, and kind of maybe sorting that out and reviewing it, and um, kind of never had experienced much kind of local government. But I just wanted to say that I've really been surprised at how responsive you all have been, and just really appreciate kind of just no matter what the outcome is tonight or kind of what the planning, all of that is, just sort of like relooking at everything has just been really great, and we just are really thankful for all of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very kind. Okay, um, <coughs> Commissioner Responses. Has anybody addressed her situation? Yes, uh, Ms. Williams reached out to our office back at the uh, 1st of January to let us know uh, that she, the difficulties that she was experiencing. And we brought that to uh, Ray Fipperman's attention at EMS. And I uh, spoke with Ray about this today, about Ms. Williams' uh, issue today. Ray indicates to me that EMS has sent the bill back to the insurance company for one final attempt to see if it will be paid. We have not yet heard from the insurance company if they will reject it or pay it. But as soon as we do, we'll reach out to Ms. Williams and come to some kind of an arrangement with her. And once we do, I'll be sure and let y'all know. But we are aware of it. Um, you know, this has occurred. We just recently switched insurance, uh, excuse me, billing companies. We went from AMB to, I believe it's EMS Corporation now. 
So we were having issues with A and B uh, at the end for their assistance they were giving us in billing. So hopefully we'll hear back from the insurance company and uh, uh, timely very soon. But we will be in touch with Miss Williams. Well, we uh, should be able to absorb that. If not, I mean, I'm, she did her part. Sure. That's it. Well, I, I, I think what Ray has asked is we let it run one more course with the company and see if we're going to recoup any, any funding, or if not, I expect that will be the course we'll go. Yeah. Sounds like she's had about as much fun as dealing with AT&T, right? Sure, <laughs> yes. We are hearing better things about our new company. Yeah. Uh, All right, thank you, Ms. Williams, for bringing that to our attention. <coughs> so next item is uh, a motion <coughs> for approval of the agenda. I move. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, next is approval of the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so we got to, to talk about our um, the review of the renewable energy generating facility. Here's our planning director, Tom. Looks like we could come and walk in you these days. <laughs> right. So what we're looking at tonight, take you back a little bit. Um, the board voted on the new Hydo in November. So our moratorium expired at the beginning of December, so it became fully effective. Then in January, we heard some comments about solar and how that was placed in the new Hydo. Board asked for the planning board to relook at that and make maybe some type of recommendation to you all what they would think would be a good idea. So the planning board's regular scheduled meeting was January 9th. Unfortunately, we did not have a quorum at that meeting. However, the ones that were there decided we should meet before you all meet again. So they met on January 13th, that following Monday. So it went from a Thursday to a Monday meeting. At that meeting, planning board did discuss what they would like to see or what they would recommend to you all. In that discussion, they decided the couple things. The best place for solar would be in a class one. Their original recommendation to you all was 125 foot setback with no land spacing requirement for class one. So you all approved 150 foot setback with no land spacing. So they thought oh, it's a 25 foot difference, it's okay. Let's recommend just a class one. But in the same thing, they decided that the heavy industrial development ordinance probably is not the best place for solar farms. And they would like to make the recommendation to pull out solar farms and write it as its own ordinance for the county and do that in this calendar year with some guidance and help from staff to see if we could get something that maybe would apply to solar farms a little better than what the Hydro does. Because it does, it. solar farms feel a little different than a lot of the other uses there yeah. on the solar farms. So what, what kind of time frame are we talking about? Because I'm sure some of these people are anxious to have a definite what they got to do. So the planning board made that recommendation to see what you all would do with it. They would like to meet at their February meeting to really put a strategy together. They said by the end of the year, it will take some time to start from scratch on a new ordinance to make sure it does what it needs to do. But their true strategy will come after they hear from you all. But they don't feel like it fits here. They would like to draft something new. So are you saying that we don't have a recommendation tonight for the Board of Commissioners to set a public hearing? on uh, moving the solar farms from a class two to class one? They did, they did recommend that. They want to right. go so ahead and move that for now. With that. And then hold on to that while okay. this other is yeah. being written. I was misunderstanding that. Yeah, that's I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So that. class that's move better. to class one, Lower live with there. the 150 foot until something new can be drafted very specific to that use. And recommended the public hearing. Public hearing takes two weeks of um, advertised notice uh, to consecutive weeks before a meeting. So what would we, we want to set a public hearing for? What would be the date? Uh, I believe February 17th would be y'all's best day. I think if we head to the February 3rd meeting, we could maybe squeeze, depending on what I could get in the newspapers this week. Mr. Albright, <laughs> would we be able to schedule a public hearing? Would we be, I think it's just a 10 day requirement. Could we have a public hearing on the? Solar farms on February 3rd. 
I have the statute actually right here. It can be advertised. It's got to have 10 days. Yeah, it must be advertised. It's one. Tuesday, yeah. so we got one day. Can we do it by right. Thursday? Yeah, so it shall be published the first time, not less than 10 days, not more than 25 days before the date fixed for the hearing. It must be advertised twice within the two weeks prior. I think we could get something in for Thursday print. We got to print it one, one newspaper. Just right, one. just one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think we should do that because the solar farm people have been really um, <coughs> strung up by the changes to the ordinance and have been consistent in seeking us to change that. I would move that we have a public hearing on the third, is that right? That would be the next. That's a morning meeting. Second. I'll just make a comment that um, that probably being a boarding meeting is better for the solar farm people because then they can come during their work day. Um, we have a motion and a second to schedule a public hearing on the revi the revisions to the heavy industrial development ordinance as pertains to the solar farms. Um, is there any discussion about that? I'd like to call that just the renewable energy generating facilities because it does include more than solar, although that's okay. Okay. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> and then as far as writing a whole new ordinance that pertains just to solar farms, is there any kind of forecast or thought <coughs> about how they would change it? I mean, what's wrong with the solar farms just being a class one. What is it that's not, I mean, I understand the concept that it doesn't really fit within a heavy industrial ordinance, but functionally, what would they change about it? I know they were talking about buffers and landscaping specifically, and looking at 25 foot or 50 foot, would it be better to add footage or better to add buffer kind of thing? So maybe altering what it, landscaping and everything else looks like. Maybe setback differences uh, as opposed to a road compared to a residential property on either side or something like that. It's kind of what they were playing with. I got a phone call today about the buffer or setback issue of 150 feet around the boundary of the property. What if the solar farm itself is only in a portion of the property that may not require a buffer around that? Like if you bought 100 acres, but you were only going to use 25 acres for a solar farm, then if you had to put a buffer all the way around the border of the property, that language would probably need to take a look at. Right, and like some of the heavy industrial development ordinance, like you said, they're <coughs> buying land. These solar farms are usually leasing land for 20 to 25 years is how the contracts are generally going. So they even look different in that way. They don't own it. They're just owning the rights for yeah. a little while. Right. And as far as disturbance of the land, they're very, very minor compared to an asphalt plan or rock where it's on to it looks totally different when it's yep. on the ground. That's right. So those are kind of some of the things they're exploring is kind of what the nuisance is and how you respond to that. Well not a number of counties already have ordinances. Right, and a lot of them, thirty to fifty feet seems yeah. to be a much more common setback. <coughs> NC State did a study on this a while ago, so they have a template ordinance for counties to kind of get started with. I don't know if our board will entertain that. They've asked for research from staff of what everybody's doing around us and anybody that looks like us, so we're putting that together for them. Okay, I think we have a consensus that that would be okay to move forward. They want to do that. that. Yeah. And we'll set the public hearing. Okay, and then you have something else. The next item on the agenda is yours. Next tip. Uh, okay, so this one actually is a little more straightforward ish. What we're looking at is planning board membership. We have one member that is looking for reappointment, uh, Mr. Brooks. Gene Brooks has been on the board, served one term. He will be allowed to serve a second term. And so he's asking to be reappointed for that. What we also have is two seats that uh, people have turned out. They served their two terms, they have to wait a year, and then they can come back. So planning board reviewed all the applications. We had 10 applications, one being the reappointment, and then one uh, person decided to withdraw. So nine applications, eight of uh, new members. So Andrea Cheek and Eric McPherson were recommended to take these seats. 
uh, their term would start and it would end December 2023 and they could take a second term after that and then they would turn out as well. Um, any questions? You, I think you all have a copy of everybody's yeah. application. And there's a limit on how many people from different townships can serve That's on right. the planning board. Is there Are there any complications with that with any of these applicants? Like if Right, so we don't have any complications with that. That was part of the planning board having to assess that. Um, if Gene is appointed by you all, he will cap out our Fawcett Township. We're only allowed three members per township. And we had a couple that were, Mr. McPherson and Mr. Sidnor were both trying to get a seat and the Patterson Township would only accept one more. So one of, each, one of those had to be picked and one not. That was our only conflict for townships. I think that we accept the recommendation. Okay, we have a motion and a second to accept the recommendation of the planning board to reappoint Jean Brooks and then to approve Andrea Cheek and Eric McPherson. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And I just want to say we really appreciate these people who are willing to serve. Um, we've got some really fine people, community members on this list. And um, it's nice when they volunteer, isn't it? It really yeah, is. Yeah, and yeah. we very much appreciate their yeah. willingness to serve. And uh, Tori, will their applications continue to be held by the county? Because they, they don't roll off, so they might be able to come up again. Right? Okay, that'll be good. All right, the next item on our agenda is the annual audit presentation. So Elsa Watts is here. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. On behalf of Martin Starnes and Associates, I'd like to present Alamance County's 2019 audited financial statements. Some audit highlights. The county received an unmodified opinion. This is a clean audit opinion. I'd also like to thank Susan Evans, finance officer, as well as the rest of the finance department and DSS. We've worked with them throughout the year on the audit. Everyone is wonderful to work with. Um, I'd also like to mention that there is a new auditing standard that requires the finance officer to have the skill, knowledge, and experience to oversee the audit services, and Susan Evans is that contact. Thank you, Susan, and it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Elsa. Same here. Taking a look at your general fund, revenues for the year were $153.9 million, an increase of about 5%. Expenditures were $147.1 million, a decrease of about 1%, and I will detail these further along in the presentation. Total fund balance for the general fund was $51.8 million. This is an increase of $3.1 million. This increase is due to revenues exceeding expenditures for the year. The LGC um, uses available fund balance to compare you to other units, and this is calculated by taking your total fund balance, which was $51.8 million, less non-spendable items of $330,000, less items restricted by state statute of $9.9 million, $9 million this gives you an available fund balance of $41.6 million. This is an increase in available fund balance of $4.7 million, which is due to an overall increase in fund balance of $3.1 million, combined with a decrease in your stabilization by state statute of $1.5 million. Available fund balance as a percent of expenditures for the general fund was 28.3%. This is an overall increase of about 3.6%. Unassigned fund balance for the general fund was $18.3 million. You had total general fund expenditures of $147.1 million. And this gives you an unassigned fund balance as a percent of general fund expenditures of 12.49%. And the total unassigned fund balance decreased as a result of increases in committed and assigned fund balance. Looking at your top three revenues for the general fund, 
You had property taxes, which made up 55% of total revenues. Local option sales taxes made up 20% of total revenues. And restricted intergovernmental revenues, your federal and state grants were at 12% of total revenues. And you had other revenues of 13%. Property taxes were $84.4 million. This is an increase of about 6%. <coughs> Local option sales taxes were $31.5 million, an increase of 6%. Restricted intergovernmental revenues, your federal and state grants, were $18.9 million, an increase of 6% as well. <coughs> Overall, very comparable to the prior year. Expenditures for the general fund, you had education at 32% of total expenditures. Human services was at 21%. Public safety was at 25%, and you had other expenditures of 22%. Education had expenditures in the general fund of $47.2 million. This is an increase of 4%. Human services expenditures were $30.6 million, a decrease of 2%. And public safety expenditures were $36.4 million, a decrease of 2%. Overall, very comparable to the prior year. The landfill fund had an operating income of $283,000, investment in capital assets of $9.4 million, Unrestricted net position, which is what's available to spend in the fund, was just over $9 million. And total net position of $18.4 million. There was a $3.1 million decrease in total net position, which is due to a new <coughs> statement of $3.5 million related to a correction of asset depreciation in the fund. And this does conclude my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Do you ever do any comparisons to comparably sized counties with the breakdown in revenues and expenses? I don't, but I can I, I can provide that information for you if you have any in mind. Okay. Do you want to look at counties just in your area or in your size? Probably size. Would be yeah. More, more size. likely size. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Y'all do a great job. All right, Mr. Hago, a fiscal policy review. Well, good evening, commissioners. I uh, wanted to take an opportunity to, you've had, you have the audit information, you have a full copy of the audit in front of you. And I thought, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure we stay compliant. We have our own internal policies that the board has approved uh, about how we need to do business. And I thought after hearing the audit, it would be helpful for you to hear uh, how we're stacking up with our own policies that are uh, board set. So when we talk about the county's financial policies, uh, we have four different types that the, the board has put in place. We have capital improvement and budget policies, debt and reserve policies, budget development policies, and cash management and investment policies. And these are included in your packet. We're not gonna change them tonight. We're simply, I'm simply gonna go over how we're doing in light of the policies that you have in place. So we'll start off just uh, talking a little bit about our capital improvement budget policy. Commissioners will remember this fiscal year is the first time we've had an adopted capital plan in quite some time. And it includes a seven year capital improvement plan and uh, budget for projects and we are following those guidelines. We're identifying revenue sources and tracking our expenditures. We feel like we are in compliance with our capital improvement budget policies. As for debt, uh, last year when the, we were preparing ourselves for the potential issuance of debt for the education bond, uh, bond uh, projects, the commissioners adopted a couple of new policies that had to do with the county's debt. And you have this graphic in your handout also. It's got uh, uh, the pictures of graphs and tables. Uh, basically, there are three debt ratios that the, the commissioners have, have set. One is that our 10-year debt payout ratio uh, remain above 50%, and we are in that position now with our current debt. Uh, another policy the board has approved is debt as percentage of assessed value of textbook property. So this is our debt uh, as compared to the total value of our tax base. 
and the idea uh, in the policy is to remain at less than 3% and we are meeting that uh, benchmark. We're at 0.38% uh, right now. And debt service as a percentage of general fund expenditures. Uh, the policy we have is uh, to maintain debt at less than 15% of our general fund expenditures and we are at 6.4%. So what these things tell you is uh, based on our current debt, we are in position to take on additional debt as we have talked about numerous times. Then uh, our reserve policy, this is where we talk about our fund balance here. Elsa uh, talked a little bit about our different types of fund balance. The policy that we have is for unassigned fund balance. This is our money that's free and clear, not committed to any specific use. Uh, the county's policy is to target 20% of general fund expenditures with our unassigned fund balance. We are not at 20%, as uh, you just heard from our auditor. We're at 12.49%. Uh, and I'll tell you that some of that has to do with uh, the fact that this past year uh, we properly committed funds uh, for other projects. A good example would be our uh, animal shelter dollars that we promised to the city of Burlington. Well, we made some changes in making sure those funds are, in fact, committed. And if you'll recall, uh, in 1819, we did approve some reimbursement resolutions for uh, the school system. So some of those things are going to have impact on our unassigned fund balance. But We'll be addressing unassigned fund balance usage in our upcoming budget uh, process. If you recall, for the past three years, we have reduced the amount of unassigned fund balance that's been committed to balance the budget. Very small amount, I think it was, in 1718, a little more in 1819, 1920, when the school system uh, didn't ask for any increase, we, we really reduced uh, the amount of unassigned fund balance uh, that we have been using to balance the budget. But we are compliant with other reserve policies uh, related to our enterprise and designated funds. So this is an issue for us, unassigned fund balance. We'd like to see that grow, and we certainly don't want to commit any more of it if we can at all help. Uh, in our budget development policies, uh, we've looked at ourselves, and we are following the board's policies on uh, how we're doing collections. And uh, one of the policies that the board uh, has in place is that you receive financial reports on at least a quarterly basis, and we've been putting those uh, in the in the board packets on a regular on a regular basis. We do have a few issues in our budget process uh, that we are not compliant with our own internal policies. One is the employee insurance fund. We've been talking about that a great deal over the past couple of years, and we I am very happy to say that through a lot of hard work committing additional funds to the insurance uh, insurance issue, we've gone from a little over $2 million in the hole to, I believe for this audit, we're about $750,000 in the hole. That's still in the hole. So we are out of compliance, but we are gaining ground. Right way. That's right. <laughs> and uh, we do have a plan to address that. We also, uh, from 1819, we did have a budget issue. Um, it's not a finding, but it is an issue for us to make sure that we keep in mind. We had a grant for the Family Justice Center that in 1819, we did not receive uh, the, the reimbursements for the expenditures that we made during the fiscal year 1819. So that's an issue for us. We're working with DSS right now to uh, apply for those funds. And we also had an issue with the landfill budget. We live in a modified accrual world, and when we report the landfill via the audit, it goes to full accrual. This uh, our accountant folks can can do a better job than I can explaining the difference between modified accrual and full accrual. Bottom line. When we report the landfill situation in full accrual, we, uh, while we saw a profit, we had spent more than we had budgeted once we moved to accrual for salaries and pension liabilities. It's not a big deal, but it is not in compliance with our policy. So we are on that issue also. <coughs> we are compliant with our cash management and investment policies that the board has set. Uh, for fiscal year 1819, our investments are uh, have been reviewed and have been found to be compliant. In your packet was an LGC, the Local Government Commission, Form 203 that we submit twice a year to the Local Government Commission. They'd like to know where all our money is, where all of it's invested, and how we're holding it, and we are compliant. And a final piece to mention uh, to, to let the board know that we are in compliance in that we do sell bond debt. We're required uh, to make our information available to investors because people select to invest in Alamance County. That's basically what the bonds are when we sell bonds on the bond market. So we are required by the uh, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board to release our information to investors. So we have done so. We've provided our audit, uh, our debt information, um, our tax and budget info. 
So just a summary from a financial policy perspective, we're applying the, the board approved policies uh, to all of our expenditures and all of our funds. Uh, I believe we're applying them appropriately. We have a few issues. We ha are implementing our capital plan, doing a good job tracking it. As you can see from our debt ratios, we are well prepared. We remain well prepared for the future bond debt issuances. We have some minor budgetary policies, but uh, the, the largest one, uh, in my humble opinion, is that employee insurance fund, and we have made some really good strides uh, in it. And when it comes to fund balance, we are actually, uh, I call it mapping. I like to call it mapping our fund balance. We know exactly what is committed, what is not. And we do. We are starting to forecast our fund balance. We're, we're looking at uh, what's going to happen when we spend some of these monies that are designated. So I feel pretty comfortable, while I can't guarantee you that we will move to 20%. Uh, that's, a, that's a very aggressive and bold uh, goal to have for unassigned fund balance. I can assure you that we are aware of how we have it designated uh, and where we're using it and have made a real conscious effort for the past couple of years to reduce it as a use of balancing the budget, which I think is a, is a good, good thing to do. Um, if you have any questions, there's no action to take on this, but uh, I feel like making this a part of uh, the annual update. When you receive your audit, to have the manager come before you, tell you how we stand on all of our uh, financial policies, if we're in compliance or not, it's a good thing for the board to hear. So. Do we know what the uh, bond interest, anything, are we getting any information about what the bond interest rates might look like? I think currently they're below what we uh, estimated for our Davenport plan, which I want to say it was 4.5%. Is that right, Susan? I can't remember. I get 4.5 uh, confused. Yeah, I believe it was 4.5 that was included in the financial plan. One indicator that we're seeing is, um, if the board will recall, on the last two installment ones that we have placed with banks, we are seeing the interest rates still below that 2%, and we're hoping that trend will translate over into the bond market when it is time to sell bonds. Again, all this is good news. As uh, we reported at the joint meeting with the school system, you know, we were conservative in our planning for the bonds, uh, hoping to be able to take them into, into account, uh, construction costs, increases, things like that, so we can make sure these projects get done. So all this is good news, uh, I, I believe, and I believe the fact that the insurance rates are still staying down is good for us. Too. I believe Trump's bailing us out again. <laughs> all right, anybody have any other questions about the policies? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right, Susan, we have an audit contract to present. Good evening, commissioners. Um, at this time, I'd like to bring before you the audit contract that we would award to Martin Stars for fiscal year 1920. That contracted price would be for a total of $95,270. This does include a slight <coughs> increase um, in their base of $2,700. We would see the audit contract going from $90,000 to $92,700. And then we would have an additional $3,000 for any major program compliance testing that would be above and beyond five programs. Well, are we not on a three-year contract? We are. When we awarded the RFP, it was for a three-year period, but the LGC requires us to bring this annual contract back to the board each year for approval. So in our original, though, we didn't have like a stated amount for three years. It was, and if I remember correctly, the ninety-five thousand was included in that. Um, let me pull it up. I got it right here. Um, that that was included in the second year, but I can verify that. Well, I'm, I'm taking it for granted that you're checking on that for us, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Do you need a, a motion? Yes, sir. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve this audit contract as presented. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, and then we have a capitalization policy revision. Yes. Before you, commissioners, I'm also bringing um, the request for us to remove library books and library audiovisual materials from the capitalization policy. Currently, they are on a five-year useful life depreciation schedule. Best practices would be to remove those because of the ever-changing volumes as well as technology. This would see a decrease in the county's assets by $1.7 million, but it does not affect our general fund balance. These are in the front section of the audit, which would be our statement of net position. Make a motion we approve this. 
second. We have a motion and a second to approve that capitalization policy revision. Is there any discussion or questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Haygood, back to you. We got a popular annual financial report. Indeed, uh, commissioners, again, this item does not require any action by the board. Uh, this is uh, an effort that we do. It's voluntary. Uh, county Finance Department and County Manager's Office works together, uh, works together to put this information out there uh, for the public. Um, we, we have done this one other time. We received uh, an award from the Government Finance Officers Association, and I suspect that uh, once we release this uh, report, we will receive another one. So I appreciate all the work that goes in behind the scenes making this happen. This is basically a, uh, a very s brief summary of our audit and information that's included in our audit. In fact, a great deal of it is uh, from the audit. However, there is some interesting information in the report. I think you can look, uh, and you have a copy of this, I believe, in your packet. You can look on page three uh, and see some information about our county population continuing to grow. I think uh, that's a trend that we certainly will see. And yeah, that's a crazy graph right there. Y'all should put that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> and this is from the U.S. <laughs> Census information, which, you know, we're working very hard now with our complete count committee uh, and all of our partners to get the word out about the U.S. Census. It's really important that... Uh, we get an accurate count for Alamance County. And you can see what's happening here. People are uh, flocking to the county. It's a good place to live. So I thought that was an interesting uh, an interesting takeaway for you. Um, also on page four, you can see the top employers in Alamance County. And of course, it's uh, always interesting to me to see Alamance County government listed in that top, that top list. Uh, we have a lot of folks that work for Alamance County and uh, for all of these, these uh, agencies here. So that gives you an idea of the major players in the economy in our county. And then uh, on page five, I thought it would be of interest to the commissioners to take a look. This, These are workload measures that are reported uh, on a monthly basis through our performance management program. And uh, you know, you can see in, in, some, in some of these measurements, we're seeing an upward uh, trend in numbers. Uh, I think looking at uh, the 911 CAD entries is a good, a good example of, uh, you know, we're seeing growth and we're seeing more folks move to the county. And we're seeing some of these numbers go up and some of these numbers go down, but uh, we are tracking them. And we're going to be doing a mid-year performance management report very soon for the commissioners for fiscal year uh, 1920. So we'll be talking about any trend data that we see there also. Um, again, all of this information is included in the audit and is information that you have just seen. I think the last piece that I would highlight is page 9. Uh, that is a, a big picture of all government funds uh, in Alamance County. This is our general fund. It's uh, everything we do, fire tax, employee insurance, the works. And uh, I think what, what you'll see here that's interesting is that for the last fiscal year, um, excuse me, in 17, 18, we, we were required by the state to start implementing uh, GASB 75 where we start reporting our long-term liability costs uh, so that's our pension benefits for our employees our retirement insurance things like that uh, you'll see that we're now reporting ourselves at a negative net position total uh, that is really because of those uh, other post-employment benefits OPEP uh, counties and cities are now required to report this um, it, it's you know uh, it's interesting to look at what we think our long-term our long-term liabilities are for these uh, these benefits, but we are not required to fund them. It is required, though, to demonstrate to the board uh, and to the public that there are costs uh, associated with these benefits. So, and you know, there's some some rumor that we may actually stop reporting this way. We don't know, but as long as we're required to do it, we will. So, anyway, as I said, there's no action to be taken from this report. After this meeting, we'll be posting this information online for the public to be able to consume. Anybody have any remarks? Are there any cool? I think it's fascinating that we have half a million visitors to our county parks every year. We have uh, 162,000 people in the county now. Yes. And in 2019, 521,000 people visited our county parks. That's oh. remarkable. I saw Brian Baker here earlier. I don't know if he was still still around, uh, but yes, they they. It's a busy place as all of them. 
There's a lot of interesting stuff in here. I encourage people to take a look at it. Does he may have anything? Yes, sure. There he is. Oh, hey, Ryan. Good job. Good job on the park. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is the fire marshal, Mr. Johnny Payne, has a request for a change to a fire district map. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I come before you tonight for a minor fire district adjustment in Alamance County, Northern Park. I was contacted by a gentleman who lives at 1989 Jordan Meadows Drive, which is at the dead end off of McRae Road. <coughs> He went to renew his homeowners this year with a different company, and his insurance went up $279. So he does some investigation, found out that he lives outside of Fawcett's Five Mile District, and I actually wrote it out there. He is 5.6 miles from Fawcett's Fire District, um, but 3.5 miles from North Central. So he wanted to change his district to the closest fire district to get his insurance premiums lowered. Um, I was. Uh, contacted the homeowners out there in the area and told him what was going on. Everybody's in approval other than one I could not reach. The states that I had to reach 66%. It was four properties out there, so I reached 75% of them. Uh, just the maps through GIS, which is a map including your packet. Once y'all vote to approve or disapprove, it goes before the Office of State Fire Marshal and then to ISO for their approval and hopefully the insurance will come down for these customers and citizens out in that northern part of the county. Uh, Fawcett has to go deep into North Central's district to access this dead end road. It's about a mile and a half off McCray Road. So this will give North Central Fire Department this whole district down that road. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve that proposed change to the fire district map. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. thank you. All right, we have an update to the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council funding plan. Good evening, Commissioners. Before you tonight is a request to approve an additional $62,396 in additional state funding for the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. This is in, res in result to legislation um, that changed the age of the juveniles from 16 to 17. This will increase the county's funding, so at this time, I would ask for the commissioners to approve the funding plan as well as to allow us to amend the budget for these additional funds. Second. This requires no additional state uh, county dollars. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that plan and amend the budget. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next item on our agenda is public speakers who wish to be heard on items unrelated to things on the agenda. Uh, we do have, as I think I mentioned before, a public comment policy which is available to, on the line to be reviewed before people come to a meeting. But just a quick highlight, uh, the total po public comment period will be limited to 30 minutes total. Each speaker gets three minutes to make his or her remarks. Um, and there's other stuff. You have written remarks or supporting documents you are encouraged to hand those up to the board and to leave them with the clerk and they'll be included in the minutes so with that being said the first uh, person is Brian Box good evening good evening in respects to uh, many changes uh, across our nation right now and <clears throat> here on our home front in North Carolina, there are a lot of concerned citizens, especially in this county, um, with things concerning the Second Amendment, the United States Constitution. So tonight, um, myself and two other fine gentlemen here would like to introduce a resolution uh, for the county in hopes that you will adopt uh, to make many citizens here uh, feel more comfortable with uh, such a controversial issue at hand. A number of the counties um, in North Carolina have adopted 
such paperwork and uh, it's also something that's um, <coughs> taking place in many states and many counties in our United States. Thank so, goodness. Yeah. Thank Amen. Goodness. I do have uh, a few things I'd like to uh, hand you all. Sure. So that'd be great. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, we'll come back if we have questions for you and things like that. We'll come back to that when we have uh, commissioner responses after all the public speakers are heard. The next one is Joe Allen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Here we are again. <laughs> Another two A witch hunt, I guess. And that's what we're just trying to cut the head off the snake before it gets too big. So I know where y'all stand. Y'all were supportive last time. We had a meeting with the sheriff a couple of days ago. He was supportive with our mission. And so I just trust that y'all make the right decision like you always have and back the people of Alamance County and protect us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Enjoy. Allen. Okay, Bradley Dixon. My name is Bradley Dixon, and I'm a 33-year-old, lifelong, 10th generation resident of Alamance County. I join you tonight to request that the county adopt a policy to protect the United States Constitution, and specifically, the Second Amendment. I do not recall the first time that I fired a gun. I was too young to remember. This is no surprise because guns were a sacred tool to a family of hunters. It is well known that each member of the Dixon family has always been immersed in hunting. My dad and grandfather took me hunting at an early age and demonstrated gun safety to me for my first solo hunt. Family and friends would gather many times a year to target shoot for recreation and to increase skills for accuracy and the coming hunting season. I was also instructed by my father at an early age how to defend myself with a firearm. In our home, firearms have always been just as important for home safety as they are for hunting. My dad always kept a 12 gauge shotgun in his bedroom loaded with buckshot for the dreaded instance of a robbery or attack. As a grown man, I continue to have firearms for hunting and for personal protection. Firearms have always been dear to, to me. I would say that I represent the majority of Alamance County gun owners in that respect. With the introdu introduction of new gun laws in Virginia, I felt it not necessary to stand by my brothers Joe Allen and Brian Boggs with the idea to unite the county under a Second Amendment protection plan. The proposed gun bills in Virginia may be intended to stop mass shootings, but in reality they are limiting responsible gun owners and opening the door to more restrictive gun laws in the future. The Second Amendment protection proposal would ensure to citizens that no new unconstitutional gun laws would be upheld in the county of Alamance. For 229 years, the Second Amendment has given the United States citizens the right to private gun ownership. I do not want to sit silently while the Constitution is slowly ripped apart. The citizens of Alamance County are asking you to provi provide peace of mind that the Second Amendment will be upheld under any circumstance and continue to secure the their rights to own the weapon of their choosing for hunting, recreation, and personal defense. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Dixon. Okay, we have one last speaker signed up. That's Barbara Day. Thank you for having me, Commissioners. This is my first time here. Glad you're here. My name, I'm, my name is Barbara Enoch Day. I am a returning citizen. Uh, back to North Carolina about a little over two years. I am also Alamance County's first New Year's baby of 1958. So I have some history here. I am a resident of the city of Burlington. And I stand before you, and good to see you again, Mr. Stephen Carter. I, he sit right behind me. I'm a part of the MLK Coalition, and we had our big weekend 
this weekend, and it was good to see you there at the service. I uh, celebration. Thank you. Yes. I stand before you, and I come to speak on, and I'm not asking questions. I come to speak on the Alameda County Detention Center. And as a taxpayer with two vehicles and a home, uh, my family's been paying taxes here for 65 years. And I've been paying them for the last 22 since my parents uh, passed on. And I've, I've spoken briefly to uh, Sean Boone, and I said, I asked him, how's the backlog? We getting it. Um, I feel like we're using the Alamance County Detention Center like a prison. I said, Sean, we got to do something. We got to uh, send them on or, uh, or send them home. So that is my concern that um, we're overcrowded. And these people are humans as well. So I want to leave this here with the commissioner uh, and hope that there will be some type of action to, you know, because you have misdemeanors. We have a lot of misdemeanors on the book, and I have a distant family member who has a son there, and he's in there for a murder charge, and murderers do need to, they do need to be dealt with if they're found guilty. It's a multiple, it's, it's four or five of them, and they've been there almost four years. And I know that this state does not have um, speedy trial laws, but we have to stop feeding these people. Send them on and let state feed them. It, 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 that saves money for the county. So that's all I wanted to speak on. Let's see. I all think right. that's Thank good. Well Patty. delivered. It's well perceived. Yeah. I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Thank sure you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Miss Day. I would caution that uh, the sheriff's not here tonight, and he would be the person to really address concerns he's working about on it. Overcrowding. So it's unfortunate that he's not here. Maybe Byron Tucker, do you want to speak on the sheriff's <laughs> behalf about sheriff's conditions behalf. of the jail, or would you prefer to defer to the sheriff? Well, first of all, um, to speak to your point, the Alamance County Detention Center is not a prison. Uh, we're not set up as a prison facility. These folks are here for, uh, we hope, a temporary stay, but sadly that's not always the case. Uh, there have been some uh, issues in the jail with uh, crowding, uh, and Sheriff uh, is addressing that issue with jail management, uh, namely uh, Major Miles. Uh, but it is, it is an issue that we constantly talk about, especially on Monday mornings, We're, which is our staff meeting. And it is, we try so hard to uh, give folks a hope there. Uh, we have the library for them. We give them uh, GED programs. Sadly, they shouldn't be lo there long enough that we engage in in getting people through there. They should be. They should. Their case should be heard. They should be moved out. So we empathize with that. We understand that. And uh, our conditions in the jail sometimes uh, we do, we do get crowded. Uh, we were talking today about in our staff meeting about the jail annex, uh, but that jail annex. Um, uh, we need to keep our folks in our current jail and not move them somewhere else. Uh, so that is an issue for us. But uh, to speak to your point, ma'am, uh, the sheriff and the rest of the sheriff's office is very concerned about this issue. It, it does cost a lot. And the other thing, the more people we have in jail, incarcerated, and the few people we have watching over those folks actually presents an issue for us and our safety. Yes. Not only our safety, but the safety of, of uh, other inmates that are in there. Okay. So. All right. Thank you, Byron, Thank sir, you. I got one question about that. I know we had a put some money into the DA office to have an extra person to expedite some of those mm -hmm. people in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, are we still doing that at all? I think that position is one of the district mm -hmm. attorneys at the back. I think he tell him. Yeah. What about that <laughs> <real chance? laughs> Oh, he came over to answer that question, didn't you? Uh huh. You didn't know you were going to get called for no, this thing, did you? I do want to address this today. Uh, mm -hmm. Since Mr. Boone came into the office on January 1st, and I was sworn on January 2nd as an assistant after 25 years. And what's your name, sir? Rick Champion. Okay. And uh, represented a lot of uh, criminal defendants. I, 
prosecuted my fair share too. And then back in the prosecution a little over a year, our office uh, inherited a backlog of cases uh, from the former administration uh, that was unbelievable. Um, and part of that, it's a lot of, it's everybody's to blame. Um, I don't want to blame it on one administration, but um, you've got to have people on your staff that knows a strong case versus a weak case. I think Mr. Boone has assembled a lot of folks with a lot of experience. And so in the past year, we have, on average, eliminated 67% of our backlog. That, that's uh, old sexual assault cases that were just hanging around, drug cases, and even some murder cases. But Alamance County, in the last five to 10 years, we have seen an outrageous increase and personal violence between people. Uh, we have about 40 plus people in our jail now charged with first degree murder. Um, that's unheard of in our, our, this, our size <coughs> county, I would, for us. I mean, yeah. but I personally handle um, violent assault cases. Um, and uh, I'm an old person now. Found out. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you were before I even left in 1982. I do remember your name. Been around. So, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, you've been around. When, when I was in school, we had our buddies. We'd go hunting, maybe or fishing. If we got mad at each other, we fight it out in our yards or at the school grounds. We ain't supposed to be after anymore. <laughs> but afterwards, we shake hands. It's over with. Uh, we have a, a group of young men, mainly men, uh, between 16 and 25. And it's like they're fighting over territory to sell a little bit of weed, marijuana. That $25 bag, they're carrying a gun to protect themselves and their stash. And they're shooting at each other. My, my fear is for their lives. I feel we have bond hearings to try to get some of these young men out of jail on bond hearings. But when we have those bond hearings, the thing that the family don't understand and the public doesn't understand, they're either going to be in jail where they're more safe or they're going to be on the street where they're getting shot at. Because this young man that's shooting today, when he gets out, he's going to retaliate. That's what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. a lot of retaliation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to suggest that maybe they should take their beef to the country. <laughs> but, let's not suggest that. that. No, let's not. I, I, I was in the country. We already had bodies dumped on Union Ridge Road. But, 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 <laughs> but my, my point is, is that the cases that I've been dealing with in the last year, these shootings are happening yeah. in neighborhoods where hundreds of houses are built, and these developments, mm -hmm. uh, victims are not just the guy that are pointing the gun and fire, mm -hmm. it's the neighbor's cars, and maybe their kid on a bike. And, and these young people that are witnesses, I try to reach out to them and say, look, you've got to come to court and testify, and they won't testify. So it puts me in a bind. All right, I'm Mr. trying to Chief, save their yeah, okay. lives. Mr. Chamber, I'm going to cut you off because it's I'm been, wild. yeah, we have heard right. about the jail from Byron Tucker, so we're going to, I think, Ms. Day, yeah, I think I, we've addressed your concern and well, your you comment. Have. You have. So thank you, Mr. And, Chamber. And let me say, I don't condone crime. Oh, we know you <laughs> don't. When I came along, I was born in 1958. Yes, ma'am. My friend said to me, don't get in trouble. So I'm not going to mortgage my house over <laughs> They used to say, you, you better not go to Grant. Thank you for uh, bringing that up, bringing that to our attention. And it's good to hear from Mr. Tucker that this is uh, something the Sheriff's Department is constantly on and the District Attorney's offices as well. So that's great. All right. What about Mr. Boggs, Mr. Allen, and Mr. Dixon? Um, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt that. Um, well, I'm going to... Rule that is out of order tonight because we passed our rules of procedure mm -hmm. for the county okay. commission saying that we would not, during commissioner comments, that we would not have uh, motions. Okay, I'll withdraw it. Thank you. And we'll put it on the agenda. Um, yes. I would also say that for tonight, the sheriff's <coughs> not here. And I talked to my friend Kevin Austin, who has served as the chair of the county commission in Yadkin County. And um, he said that when they put together their sanctuary and um, declaration, that they worked with the sheriff and made sure that they had communication. I think it's important that yeah, we so. communicate yeah. with the sheriff and with our county attorney and get his opinion on um, whatever we ultimately decide to do. I did have a question for Mr. Boggs. Where did the one that you handed up, 
Was this from a North Carolina county? Which county was this one from? Um, one year, Galen. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That is uh, actually for site is more what that type template uh, was taken off of. Some changes were made, uh, modifications of specific words and things like of that nature, but. Um, predominantly, that is a model from Forsyth. Okay, thank Forsyth. you. That's helpful to there, know. There's a number of those on, out there right now. Davis County is around. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I have a, I have the Yadkin County one here um, that Kevin Austin shared with me. If we could circulate that, so everybody has a chance to see that. And um, I don't know if there is a particular provision before we hand it over to the county attorney and then discuss it with the sheriff. I would like to know if there's anything in particular that the commission is concerned about um, with regards to any of the language that you've seen and anything presented. Well, I don't really read the uh, ordinances as much as, you know, Joey, you, you and I talked, right? We talked about Stokes County. Uh, Clyde, will you tell us what you've seen in the Stokes County King situation? That case was 2012. May recall Governor Purdue's declaration of emergency. King, he couldn't carry a firearm. And, and that, resulted, that resulted in a federal lawsuit in the Eastern District Federal Court. Judge Howard ruled that emergency declaration was unconstitutional. Violent. The General Assembly then changed the law for emergency declarations in 2012 that exempt legally issued pistols, rifles, shotguns, and ammunition from any such declaration. So if you've got a legal weapon or concealed carry, unless you're in a government building, you're restricted from taking it in a government building, you can carry it anywhere you want to. No matter what the emergency declaration said, you're still able to carry your um, lawful Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, that, that case goes back to where, if I'm not mistaken, they were saying if it was a snowstorm or yes. something mm -hmm. like that, and somebody wanted to go get gas or something, they couldn't have a gun that's with correct. them. Is that correct? That's correct. That's and that's the kind of absurdities the government mm -hmm. pushes uh, to, uh, toward that. Is this the last time that the government, that the judges have got involved that you know of? That's the last case that I'm aware of. I'd like to see that, that ruling if you could get it to us. <laughs> But I'll never forget that case, Joey, and that's what I was telling you about. Right. Yeah, so far, I think seven counties have adopted this. Lincoln, Stokes, yeah. Gaston is looking at it. Uh, a lot of the western counties. We'll a have it. you looked at this one, Amy? Yeah. I haven't seen it. Well, I think I sent you on the Russian Commission <coughs> one from Surrey as well. Yes, and a lot of my fellow county attorneys in the great state of Virginia also <laughs> have done it. It's about 90 hard up there. have done the same thing. King uh, is in Stokes, right? It is. That's what I'm talking about. That's the big precedent case as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, not that you got to do everything the president says or do. Can you get us a copy of the rules? Sure, yeah. I can. Yeah. All right. One thing that I would like to say real quick about it is that in looking at these uh, draft resolutions, I noticed that <coughs> it says that um, opposition to uh, efforts I mean, uh, opposing efforts to an entity that attempts to restrict the rights under the Second Amendment opposition is uh, by means deemed necessary and legal. And that to me is a very important distinction between some of the things that we've seen done in other counties. For example, when a horde of students tore down Silent Sam in Chapel Hill, they took the law into their own hands and they did something unlawful. We actually had somebody who was running for county commissioner at the time who was running for county commissioner again in Alamance County. And she went over there and got a picture taken in front of it approving of that unlawful action. And I criticized that. And I criticize it now. And uh, she was in a meet in our meeting. She was in our meeting and got up and left because her friend was texting her. Going on, she ran down there. That's right. And I also criticize the people thing. in Durham who tore down their statue. I don't think it's right when people take the law into their own hands. 
I don't think sanctuary cities for immigration is right. I don't think it's right for places to say, you know, we're not going to enforce immigration law. If it's the law, it's the law. I don't think it's right that our Attorney General refuses to do his job and represent the state of North Carolina in fighting the voter ID ruling in federal right. court. So it's important to me that these um, sanctuary resolution, whatever the commission ultimately adopts, the one that I would vote for would be something that doesn't make me a hypocrite. That is uh, so we we support the law. We follow the law in Alamance mm -hmm. County and the, and the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. And people have their Second Amendment rights under the Constitution of the Amen. United States. Amen. People don't have a right under the Constitution to tear down statues. Mm -hmm. People don't have a right under the Constitution to hide people who um, do not have legal status. But we have rights under the Constitution to um, to own firearms legally, legal firearms. So thank you for drawing that um, issue to our attention. So. Um, do we have any other commissioner responses to public comments? If not, um, Brian, do you have a, or Mr. Haygood, do you have a county manager's report? I do not. Do we have any commissioner comments in general? I would like, do you have somebody with you here tonight? Do you? Ms. Williams. Uh -huh. I do. No, no, the lady. Oh, okay. Williams. Are you by yourself? <laughs> yeah. Can we get somebody to go with her, be with her, please? Sure. No offense. Right. Oh, come on. It's cold out there, Ms. Williams. It's cold. You might need a elbow. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sutton. I'm embarrassed I didn't think about myself. Well, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Holton. Bless your heart. Um, uh, I, I wanted to go back to the, the um, make sure that y'all understand and that we're clear that we have a couple of drafts. We're going to give them to the county attorney. We're going to talk to the sheriff and be sure that we don't um, pass a resolution that he doesn't agree with since he's our elected law enforcement officer. Law enforcement. And so um, watch our agenda for the next meeting. It may be on consent, um, and it might not be a separate agenda item. So just uh, keep your eyes open for that. Okay? Thank you. Thank All right. With that, all the business of the board being concluded will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.